All right, so we are now joined by Matt Brunig. Uh, he is, of course, the founder and president of the People's Policy Project. Matt, good to see you. Oh, thanks for having me back. So uh, you had written a pretty interesting article for People's Policy Project uh, about kind of how the policy sausage gets made in D.C. and the ways in which it is, in fact, super dysfunctional. And uh, this 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 all kind of goes back to last year. You were very openly critical of certain aspects of the child care plan that Democrats were trying to include in Build Back Better. Um, specifically, I remember you pointed out uh, that the way that the child care subsidies were structured uh, would sort of inadvertently end up raising costs for certain families right above uh, the kind of threshold cutoff. And obviously, you know, Build Back Better is in limbo, if not completely dead. So, you know, we don't have to get too into the weeds of the policy specifics at this point. But maybe just start by talking about uh, the reaction from Capitol Hill and the policy world to some of these criticisms, because there was quite a lot of blowback, uh, which is interesting because, you know, we love the People's Policy Project, but I, I didn't know that that, you know, it, it was such a hot topic in Congress. So tell us about what happened. Yeah, I mean, there was there was a tremendous reaction uh, on the Hill and, and Politico and a lot of publications. Uh, the Center for American Progress uh, put out a whole tweet thread, probably, I don't know, 15, 20 tweets uh, talking about it in which they had screenshotted the headline of my uh, article and then like sort of like crossed out parts of it. And it was very, very elaborate, which, as you point out, is very funny, right? I mean, Center for American Progress has a budget of, uh, I think, over $40 million a year, uh, and our budget is a little over $100,000 a year. Um, and, uh, you know, Republicans were passing it around. I mean, it was, it was just lighting up the hill, um, going through emails and stuff. And I guess they thought, oh, man, this is, this is a real problem for us. Um, this is a talking point people are going to be able to seize upon. Um, and they, they started coming after me. I would say the most interesting instance of this was in Politico, which ran a piece that was basically just there to kind of slam me. I mean, they did talk to me for comment and stuff like that, but <coughs> they, you know, you know how these things are done. Someone must have pitched a piece to the author and they lined up quotes from everyone. Uh, Senator Patty Murray had a quote against me and um, unnamed Democratic aides mm. and uh, think tankers at CAP and the National Women's Law Center and, you know, everyone who was kind of behind it, you know, mm -hmm. sort of did all these, uh, put out all these quotes saying that I was off base. Um, but um, it was very weird, you know, what was happening because, of course, I'm reading all this material. Okay, let's see what you have to say. And it's, it was all very nonspecific, you know. Mm -hmm. I raised a very, very specific point, not a vague kind of like ideological point about the cutoff. It was a technical point. So what is your technical objection? And, and none of it really contained a technical response. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, so the D.C. Uh, Democratic policy apparatus kind of turns against you in one fell swoop. Um, Matt, maybe maybe you're wrong, right? Maybe you had a really bad idea and, you know, everybody everybody closed ranks because, you know, what you were saying was, in fact, truly, truly just beyond the pale. However, you later find out that there are several people in the policy world uh, in D.C. who privately had exactly the same concerns that you expressed publicly, but nobody wanted to say anything out loud. Um, how did you find out about this? And what does this really tell us about the policy world and kind of this like weird relationship between think tanks and politicians and um, even journalists? Yeah, I mean, you know, before even that, um, uh, I would say a couple, maybe uh, 10 days after I put that out. And like you said, I was like, oh, my God, did I miss something? I don't know what's going on. You know, normally I don't get this kind of reaction. Right. Um, the D.C. city government, weirdly enough, put out this report because a similar proposal had been uh, proposed on the city level in D.C. And they had analyzed that proposal. They had their like Department of Education, the like city level version of that to look into it. And I read that report and it's it reached the same conclusion I reached about mm -hmm. the cutoff and uh, like the mixed subsidy and all that kind of stuff. And so and then I was feeling good. I was like, OK, great. Like these people, obviously, you're not, <laughs> you know, they're not on the take. They're not, you know, it's, it's just like government bureaucrats, basically. Um, but then, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> after a while, 
you know, there were plenty of people who would kind of say, yeah, we think your analysis is right. We think your analysis is right. But no one in these think tank, everyone in the think tank world that were like childcare advocates, like everyone in the childcare space, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Just last week, this is really when I found it out, Matt Iglesias in his newsletter, Slow Boring, uh, he was reading my stuff at the time. Um, I know, you know, he would tweet it out sometimes and link mm -hmm. to it sometimes in his newsletter. And uh, he, he revealed that uh, during this process, you know, I guess he put out feelers to talk to other think tank people. Uh, he's got a lot of connections uh, in DC and, uh, you know, just talk to people privately. And he, he wrote on his newsletter last week that um, he asked around and, and someone told him that there was uh, one of their colleagues at one of these main, uh, you know, mainstream left center left think tanks said that they had noticed the exact same problem that I had noticed before I noticed it like mm -hmm. um, but that you know she brought it up internally in the organization and they had told her to keep quiet because quote the care groups have always been supportive on other issues mm -hmm. so kind of a political quashing of this right. uh, technical problem so I that that gets to something else about the policy world, which I think is interesting. On the one hand, you have sort of this extreme party discipline that that you and Iglesias sort of alluded to that, you know, people behind the scenes didn't want to uh, upset or antagonize some of the other think tanks or other, you know, advocacy groups that they had worked with in the past. Um, but something else you point out in your piece is you mentioned that as you were sort of tracking and covering the various family and child care provisions in Build Back Better, um, you, along the way, basically discovered that an unsettling number of policy experts, Capitol Hill journalists, and even some actual sitting members of Congress just oftentimes seemed to have no idea what was in a given bill. Um, how exactly does this happen? Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in general, obviously, these bills are very big, and it's going to be hard for a lot of people to read them. Um, but what they usually do is they put out these little fact sheets, these section by section fact sheets. And, you know, they can be pretty long, too. But, you know, the idea is, well, the child care section could be summed up in maybe, you know, 50 words if you were really, you know, economical about it. And so you could kind of go through the bill that way. And, um that that fact sheet was wrong. It was wrong in a number of ways, actually. I remember, uh, and I didn't pre bring this up in my piece, but I remember at one point I was reading the New York Times coverage of the bill, and they had some numbers in there that I was just like, that is not right. I, I, I'm I crazy. And I went and reread the section. And then eventually I put it together that the section by section kind of cheat sheet had the wrong numbers in it. And the New York Times mm -hmm. had reported that. I actually tried to get them to correct that, and they never did. Uh, it's still incorrect on the website now. But... Um, yeah, so if that section by section fact sheet doesn't get updated, people don't know. And so what had happened was the pre-K uh, part of the bill, uh, which um, you know was often reported as like universal pre-K, the government's going to provide universal pre-K. Right. It wasn't that at all. What it was was the federal government was promising to cover 100% of the costs of any state that wanted to do universal pre-K uh, for three years. And then from there, it would be a little bit less, and then it would drop to zero. That was how it was initially written. And then they swapped that out for saying we'll cover 100% of the first three years, we'll only cover $18 billion of costs for the first three years for the whole country. So that's mm -hmm. like $6 billion a year. I mean, it's basically nothing. They didn't update the fact sheet. Um, and so the only way you could know about it is if you were reading the legislative text every time it was updated. Um, and I was doing that for a few of the sections, not all the sections, it would be impossible um, mm -hmm. to cover that many sections, but that was one I was reading. And so... I noticed that I was the first person to report on it. And you, I mean, that's a big development. I mean, basically yeah. that provision was essentially eliminated for the first three years, um, mm -hmm. but they were carrying on as if it wasn't. And I mean, as far as I know, very few people knew, except for probably that kind of internal group that was working on the, the bill, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe just as kind of like a broad question, how how do you think the policymaking world, um, obviously, again, not just the lawmakers themselves, but also their staffers, uh, think tank personnel. And, you know, as I mentioned before, Capitol Hill journalists, how did this kind of policy apparatus become so insular and dysfunctional? And maybe lastly, like, how do you think we can fix it? Um, obviously, independent uh, think tanks like your own is maybe one solution. Um, but but what else? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. You know, uh, in the 80s, uh, they defunded a lot of the congressional funding, like the funding for congressional staff. And that seemed to really launch a lot of dependence on outside uh, experts. 
uh, whether that's lobbyists um, for you know commercial interests, or and then you get these kind of philanthropic projects where uh, people who have a lot of money want to influence politics. Realize, hey, if I just build out an organization that does a lot of this work that Congress used to do internally, mm-hmm. now I'm kind of in the driver's seat. I can kind of push the agenda a little bit, and so you know these things become kind of hobby projects, especially lately of just ultra high net worth individuals. Um, yeah. Some um, companies donate, um, unions donate as well, but not not as much. It's really dominated by very rich people for whom this really is just kind of a hobby and um, companies who are you know trying to shade influence here and there. And so, you know, Congress runs on those entities. That's they, they, they produce the information and knowledge and policy ideas that uh, go through Congress. I mean, it, the whole child care proposal came out of the Center for American Progress in like mm-hmm. 2010. Um, you can like put your finger on, on where where it started, and it just kind of moved from there. And yeah, I mean, the, it, it, that would be kind of all well and good. I mean, it's never all well and good, but at least in theory, like, oh, we have this kind of group of think tanks, this sector of think tanks, and they all kind of fight back and forth. And I've got a child care proposal, and you've got a child care proposal, and we argue about it, and maybe mm-hmm. something emerges out of the end. And that's just not what happens at all, right? <laughs> like, yeah. A few kind of power players at the top of some of these significant organizations, I mean, they kind of decide on what the consensus is going to be for how we're going to move forward. And then everyone falls in line. Um, and you don't get to hear any criticisms of the proposals. Uh, the funders don't want a whole lot of uh, battles internally. They don't, you know, that's not really good business for them to be mm-hmm. fighting with one another. They want to just come together. Um, the employees, the people who work in the think tanks, they're trying to work in other things think tanks, or they might be trying to work for campaigns, or maybe on the Hill, uh, like the whole ecosystem, right, as a labor market, it's, it's not in your best interest to attack people. I mean, I experienced yeah. that personally, uh, what happens when you do that, that's why I have my own personal think tank at this point. Uh-huh. So, um, you know, y- you see how it kind of all lines up to just sort of say, well, let's get behind this and let's not say anything. And by the mm-hmm. way, if we don't say anything, it kind of is a, no one's going to say anything. Right. Like yeah. the journalists don't know. Right. And, you know so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that point about the journalists, which theoretically would be kind of one line of defense against the, you know, extreme party discipline or, you know, um, the kind of think tank propaganda. The fact that the journalists uh, so often are not pushing against these narratives or pushing against these bad policies either is pretty concerning. So maybe as like a final question for you, are there any for, for the average kind of news consumer who like wants to follow policy, but, you know, isn't like you going to like sit and track every change that every bill goes through? Like, are there resources or places that the average news consumer can turn to, to kind of get a read on uh, like the policy or like bills that are coming out? Other than your yeah. Twitter. <laughs> well, um, you know, I mean, there are some journalists who do a good job. I think um, Jeff Stein at the Washington Post does a good job. Uh, Rachel Cohen, who's now at Vox, mm-hmm. she does a good job. Um, there are a handful of other ones I'm trying to think of, of them now, but you know, th- those are people who, if they write something, I, I mean, they're usually, they have enough skepticism to know, like to yeah. not take something seriously. Um, like that's kind of what you're looking for. And it's hard to find those people. Um, yeah. so yeah, I don't know. I wish, I, I wish there was, I mean, e- even organizations that you think might, you know, it's weird. Like these organizations, they kind of take the fact that they're sort of trusted and they kind of use that as political capital, yeah. you know? And so you're kind of like, oh, well, that's a trusted organization. They know a lot about, you know, whatever it might be, um, uh, child care or whatever. And so they're not going to blow that. And it's like, uh, you'd be surprised. Like they're going right. to use that to kind of get some favor here and there. And, you know, so I would say it's really, really tough, um, yeah. you know? The only way I do it is is by nitpicking just the issues I know about. I mean, right. there are all these other issues I don't cover, and I read every the stuff everyone else does, and I'm I'm sure there's a lot of stuff there that's not quite right. But I'm right. just like, well, it's in the Times, so I guess that's probably it, you know? <laughs> right, right, yeah. All right, well, um, again, we, Matt, we will link your piece on the dysfunction of the policy apparatus in the description box below. Um, as always, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.